Welcome to the Atheist of Florida YouTube channel. We are pleased to offer some of the most significant speakers and the profound issues of our times. If you like today's video, please hit the like button. If you have already subscribed, thank you. If not, you know what to do. Uh, so, what is life ring secular recovery? Um, we're kind of the little guys in the recovery uh, community, you know. I'm, I'm sure if you think about somebody who needs a support meeting for people with uh, substance use disorder, um, uh, what comes to mind is AA and sponsors and steps. And, and um, But because we're the little guys, we're, we're kind of tenacious. And I guess, um, you know, I get to prove that tonight, right? And this was like, <laughs> so uh, I had to tie it in, right? I planned it. Um, so <laughs> Life Ring is a, a, a community of uh, secular support groups uh, for people who want to live free of alcohol and non-medically indicated addictive drugs. Um, I will point out that that non-medically indicated makes us a little unique um, in, in recovery communities. Um, uh, medically speaking, there are a lot of medications that can assist people in their recovery journeys, help with cravings and, and whatnot. Um, traditionally, 12-step organizations are very much against that. Now, individual 12-step groups may be very accepting and, and, you know, obviously you can't put everybody in the same. Uh, but, um, you know, LifeRing believes that it's not our job to interfere with the relationship you have with your doctor. <laughs> and, you know, whatever helps you do it, great. We're, we're on board with that. So it does make us a, a little unique. Um, so Life Ring works through uh, positive social reinforcement. Um, the meeting process is meant to empower the sober self. Um, and in Life Ring, we talk about the sober self and the addicted self. And I believe that's coming up a little later. So if you could go to slide three, please. Um, Life Ring has some kind of presence in all these areas that you see, um, in-person presence in, in many of them. Some of them at the moment are only an online presence, uh, you know, the pandemic. Um, some of them had in-person, only one maybe, and some of these countries and like uh, Australia. Um, and they went online for the pandemic, and they just haven't been able to get back to in-person, but they still have online meetings going on there. Um, okay, we could go to slide four. Um, so LifeRing offers originally only in-person meetings and a handful of uh, virtual meetings. Pre-pandemic, we had, I believe, four online meetings. Um, we now have, oh, if you include local online and uh, pushing 100 online meetings now. Um, uh, actually, that's been a bit of a silver lining for us. It's allowed people to find life ring who, who would not have otherwise. Um, we also have in-person meetings, and the pandemic did a number on those. Um, we have much, many fewer uh, in-person meetings than, than we did pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic, we had 200 plus worldwide. Now we have about 50. Um, uh, part of the issue for for some, well, one, you know, Life Ring conveners, the people who run Life Ring meetings, um, as a group, tend to be pretty cautious. With COVID safety, um, we follow the science, <laughs> and and so um, we have meetings that are still meeting outside. Of course, in California, they get to do that all year round. Um, some of the other parts of the country, like for me in Ohio, we 
weren't able to do that year round. We do have one in-person meeting right now in um, Ohio, um, the Akron area where I'm at. Um, we have met outside during the pandemic. Um, we have email groups, which have been around for a long time. Um, you know, people send an email and, and, and then others respond. And it, it's just like sort of like a big meeting going on um, virtually, but not, you know, in real time. And people find that very accessible and, and they can just um, respond and participate when it's convenient and when they're available. We also have a Delphi forum is like old school bulletin board early internet type thing and we have an e-pals program which is like a, a pen pal um, people who are just thinking about getting sober maybe um, aren't comfortable going to a meeting aren't comfortable maybe going to an online meeting um, they can write it, um, email in and uh, ask for an e-pal. Um, and uh, there's a few stories that are really pretty awesome. I know one situation where a um, person was incarcerated. Um, they got an e-pal. Um, they had that e-pal throughout the entire, their entire incarceration. They got out, um, stayed sober stayed in touch with their ePAL. These two individuals are friends now and, and occasionally will we'll meet up and visit with each other, which is really awesome. That doesn't happen with all of them, but we could go on to the next slide now. All right, focus meeting. We're on five, correct, uh, yes. And, and let me say I have um, put in, which is going to work really well given the way we're doing this. Um, I, you know, you certainly can ask questions at the end, but I put in a few question slides at, after certain oh. sections. So oh, it will remind me to stop and, and let you guys ask and, and it'll work really well since I'm phoning in. I can't see anybody's face. Um, Focus meetings. Uh, with the growth of online meetings, this has allowed us to have a lot of sort of specialty meetings. Um, not to say specialty meetings didn't exist before in person. Uh, of course, there are areas of the country that have had in-person LGBTQIA plus meetings. Um, I think maybe uh, Colorado had an in-person women's meeting years ago. I know we had an in-person women's in Sweden years ago. Um, uh, but those kinds of specialty meetings can be really hard. I, you know, you have a smaller number of people to, and it's hard to keep them going in, in person, especially when nobody knows Life Ring exists to begin with, let alone this niche. Um, so uh, the online meetings, this has allowed us to have a, a lot of, of different specialty meetings. We have several um, co-occurring disorder meetings we have a meeting for Spanish speakers. Um, we have a meeting for veterans who are in recovery. These are all now for people who are in recovery and also fit into these other groups. Uh, we have a, a meeting for uh, people who identify as women, uh, LGBTQIA meetings. Uh, we have the liver spot, which is, um, is primarily people who have uh, issues with their liver, probably resulting from, from the, the substance use, um, uh, or perhaps other medical issues. It, they won't kick anybody out for that. Everybody's welcomed. In fact, most of these meetings, everybody's welcome. Now, the, the um, women's meeting, um, as long as you identify you know, with a woman's environment, um, you know, veterans, I, I think they welcome everybody. Spanish speaking, you know, unless you speak Spanish, it wouldn't make sense to go. Uh, we have a men's meeting, uh, a newer people of color meeting. Um, in addition to the liver spot, I believe we just started a meeting called the kidney clatch, which again, for people who have medical issues, um, but that's primarily towards people who have um, issues, kidney issues. In fact, I was in a board meeting today and there was a member of the public there 
who was joining from a hospital. She had just gotten a transplant. Cool. So um, that was really awesome. Yeah. Um, and we have a, a meeting for people who are in recovery and also have issues with um, food. So uh, slide six, next slide. Okay. This is something else that really exciting that's happened, um, come about in part because of the pandemic. Um, as long as Life Rings existed, and that's about 25 years, we're celebrating Life Rings 25th anniversary this year. Um, uh, there's been talk about starting meetings or an email group or something for loved ones, friends and family, um, it, akin to like Al-Anon, Naranon, only in that it's for the loved ones. <laughs> but, you know, Al-Anon, Naranon, I know, have helped a lot of people, but those are technically 12-step organizations and groups. A lot of people don't do it, but um, do the steps or have a sponsor, but they actually do those things um, in there. And, of course, it's, you know, very religious. Um, so um, we've been able to first came our monthly introduction to Life Ring for friends and family. Um, and uh, followed by a Q&A session. Um, next, um, in the last couple of months, we've started a weekly friends and family meeting, um, 10 a.m. Pacific every Saturday. This is for people who have loved ones who are in um, active substance use or or in recovery but just to share how that is from their perspective um we have a question from andrea sure andrea if you want to unmute and ask your question yes i was wondering if you had a group for people who have lost loved ones and they're still grieving we do not um and uh, certainly that's something that, that would come up for, for, you know, the regular meetings, um, uh, the regular support meetings for people with substance use disorder. Um, uh, I know it's hard to find um, something that's not religiously oriented for grief. Are you talking... Um, Strictly just grieving or somebody in recovery who's who's also grieving? No, I'm just talking about anyone, whether they do drugs or not. How do, how do you, if, if, if you need a support group, most of them are religiously based. And, uh, they are. And, um, and that's and, not good. What I can do, I don't know if, uh, if um, Judy has your email, but I, I think I have some resources squirreled away on my laptop somewhere. Um, uh, the, the names of the organizations are not coming to mind, but I know that's, that's something that um, it, it's difficult to find a secular, just like it is difficult to find a secular, you know, for, um, someone with substance use disorder. So I could, I could, if I can find something, I can send it to Judy and have her pass it on for you. That'd be great. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, that is certainly an issue that um, people in recovery deal with a lot too. Um, again. Um, okay, uh, slide seven. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so why why is why is increased awareness of life ring and other support groups important? Well, I you guys probably are aware that um, you know the opioid epidemic um, certainly um, um, sorry <laughs> uh, certainly. Uh, you know, overdoses didn't start with the opioid epidemic, but, um, uh, you know, this has been bad. Um, so uh, they started going down a little bit um, and then started going back up during the pandemic. Um, 
the National Survey on Drug Use and Health in 2019 um, estimated that there were 19.3 million people aged 18 or older that had some sort of substance use disorder. Um, um, overdose deaths uh, have accelerated during COVID. I'm sorry, my husband's checking on my battery for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a group effort, uh, and I recently came to this statistic, um, nearly 92% of persons in the U.S., um, 92,000 people in the U.S. died from some sort of drug-involved overdose in the year 2020, which was the last year that particular statistic was available. Statistics always lag. Um, you know, people who have a substance use disorder d deserve to get all the information. Um, and the majority of treatment facilities and treatment providers are very 12-step based. And, and while A and NA and the other A's have helped many, many people, there are also plenty of people for whom those are not a good fit. Um, and unfortunately, people go to... Uh, seek help, medical help, and are oftentimes told the only way to do it is AA, and and that's just not true. Um, also, you know, having a loved one, a, a friend, a family member, anyone, you know, with a substance use disorder, um, it, those people should be able to feel comfortable if, if their loved one is... Um, doing something like Life Ring or there are other secular organizations, um, Smart Recovery. Um, Women for Sobriety is kind of it, it, mostly secular. Um, I, I've seen over the years many people whose families were quite distressed that their loved one had sought help and then wasn't doing it the right way, meaning the right way being going to AA, working the steps, having a sponsor. Um, so, uh, next slide. That would be number eight. Um, as I was saying, 12 steps are just everywhere in the recovery field. Um, according to uh, Sarah Zemore, who has done a lot of research, um, on alternative methods, actually, who's the lead researcher for the only organization that's done any research on all methods other than 12-step, estimated that 60%, well, 60% of the public treatment programs in the U.S. reported that they strictly used a 12-step model. And of the remainder, um, uh, a lot of them required some participation. In, um, I know from experience that uh, facilities that say, well, we're, you know, we believe in multiple pathways. We know there's no one right way. Um, yeah, sometimes that's just talk. Uh, multiple pathways has become a bit of a buzzword. And, and so sometimes it, they're still not giving other information and pretty much following a strict 12-step uh, model. Um, so th this next quote, um, well, let's see, I have a, Lance Dodds wrote a book called The Sober Truth, uh, debunking the bad science behind 12-step programs and the rehab industry. He wrote, this is a quote from his book, that most of the expensive, famous rehab centers that base their treatment on the 12 steps likewise have offered no evidence for their effectiveness. Most of them don't even study their own outcomes. Um, there's been a little bit of change in that, but there's still a lot of that. Um, un unfortunately, um, repeat business is good for business. And, I, and, and I'm not saying everybody who's involved in the treatment industry, there are many, many good people with very good intentions. But, um, and to, to be fair to those organizations and, and facilities, um, 
outcome studies are very difficult <laughs> to do with with their population. Um, recently, I was looking to update these slides. I had put this together a couple years ago, and um, I, I ran across um, some criticisms of, of this book that, that uh, Dr. Dodes wrote. And, and this one really struck me. Dr. Dode's book and comments are so far off the track of scientific research that he doesn't realize that for the past several years, the addiction research field has moved beyond asking whether AA and 12-step treatment works to investigating how and why they work. Um, the assumption is 12-step works. Everybody knows it. <laughs> if, if you question it, what's wrong with you? Because you're questioning something everyone knows to be truth. Um, part of the reason for that is because all the research, that's, there are thousands of papers that, that purportedly prove the effectiveness of 12-step. Um, only they never looked at anything other than 12-step models. Um, so it's highly possible what they're proving is that group support works, not the 12 steps necessarily. Um, another interesting note, the, uh, one of the two people who, who wrote this review of, of Dr. Dode's book, um, they were both colleagues of Dr. Dode's at Harvard Medical School. Um, one of them Individuals was actually Lifering's keynote speaker this year um, for our conference in June. Now he just talked about the like uh, biology of addiction and and a lot of neuroscience stuff, and it was very very interesting. Um, and it was kind of cool, especially cool in light of this uh, critique of Dr. Dodes that that he was exposed to something other than twelve step. Uh, next slide, please. Still, the majority of providers do not realize that there are alternatives. It's frightening. I don't know how that can still be the case, but but it is. Now, um, this was the most recent um, that I could find. Um, this was from a, a 2005. Um, paper um, stating that the you know the majority of clinicians um, are not aware of anything other than 12 step and only refer to 12 step. There's been a little research since then. Um, unfortunately, that still holds largely true. It, there's been some change, but not enough. Um, so next slide. Number 10, now I get to Sarah Zemore, um, the Alcohol Research Group and the Peer Alternatives for Addiction Study. Um, this was in 2017, maybe the, I think that might be when it was completed. Um, uh, there were several papers that came out of it on, on the slide here are the two primary papers that came out of it. This study looked at people involved with AA, Smart Recovery, Women for Sobriety, and Life Ring. Um, and it was the first time anyone had ever looked at things side by side. Um, next slide, please. So uh, the PAL study concluded um, that there was some minor differences according to, you know, the, the, the poll res study results, but um, largely people being involved with the support group that worked for them, that made sense for them, was, was what was best, and there was not any really big difference. Um, in other words, Women for Sobriety, Smart, and Life Ring worked just as well as um, 12-step models and, and AA or NA. Um, and, you know, I think it just boils down to what works for an individual. 
and I, I know there are plenty of people for whom the 12 step model doesn't work and, and things like life ring work very well. Uh, next slide, please. Number 13. Oh, did I skip a slide? Number 12, I apologize, number 12. Um, Sarah Zemore and her group are currently um, uh, working on the PAL-2, um, Peer Alternatives for Addiction 2. It's a follow-up study. It, it is also somewhat longitudinal. Uh, they did an initial uh, survey of people, and then they did a six-month follow-up, and I believe there's going to be a year of follow-up. And so the six-month follow-up happened maybe a couple months ago. So it's probably going to be a couple of years before we see any papers come out of it. But um, thrilled to see some more data. Um, PAL-1, I took one of the principal papers, printed it out, um, and that's how I finally got my local um, ADM board, Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board, to list Life Ring Secular Recovery alongside AA and NA as a resource for people looking for substance use disorder support groups. Um, I had tried for years. <laughs> Finally, I handed the right person a copy of that paper and, and up our information went. So slide 13, um, questions, any questions with this section? Um, I don't know if anybody wanted to ask this question, but in our, while we were chatting, waiting for you to get reconnected, um, it came up about the use of psychedelics to help people who are having a substance use disorder. Uh, do you know anything about that? Is that coming up um, later? Um, I, it is not in my presentation. Okay. I know very little. I know... I believe psilocybin has been used. Um, uh, um, ketamine, like, is being used to help people in depression, and ketamine yeah. is highly addictive. But it, it's not uh, ketamine's being used in a very small way. For of course, you have medical marijuana. Um, right. Life Ring does not prescribe any particular method. Um, if you are Working with a doctor um, and following medical advice, uh, it's, it's not for us to interfere with how you're achieving wow. your sobriety. And, um, you know, I, I have a good friend still to this day. I, my recovery journey did not start with Life Ring. I, I didn't know it existed in 2001. Um, I have a very good friend um, who... Uh, we would go to 12-step meetings together. This person was on methadone and would be told they weren't allowed to talk, um, which just, uh, life ring is nothing like that. Also, sometimes people uh, who are known to be using some kind of medication assistive recovery in 12 steps, again, it depends on the particular group, but um, are told they really aren't sober. Oh. They're not supposed to count their sobriety. They can't celebrate it because they're using this medication. I, you know, my take is, are are they, you know, are they three sheets to the wind? Are they laid out? Are they, no, clearly their lives have changed. They've become, you know, productive members of society. You know, it's a different right. situation. Um, but... Um, <laughs> Medical marijuana that gets a little tricky, you know, and and right. and so actually, Life Ring has written a recent policy statement on sobriety that leaves perhaps a little wiggle room because we are sensitive to the fact that medical marijuana and is legal in some places for some things, but not in others. We don't feel it's our place to judge just because you live in whatever state mm -hmm. um, and tell you that you're not sober when if you were in a different state, you would be, you know? Right. 
Um, we have a couple of questions. Karen, if you would like to ask your question, unmute and ask your question, please. Yes, I, I missed the beginning of the meeting, so I'll have to go back and look exactly and what your um, what's go, uh, how you do it. But um, I just wanted to offer if anyone's interested in knowing I went through rehab twice in Germany. Um, I stopped drinking alcohol in 1990 and have never um, relapsed. And I was in rehab for three months plus afterwards non-AA um, for marijuana abuse yeah. um, and and which is largely psychological and um, basically if you have an addictive personality um, it doesn't really matter what you're taking it's all the same many people think that there's no danger of using marijuana um, there is and having, after having been through my second rehab stage in 2017, um, I recently tried smoking marijuana again and immediately would have gotten hooked if I hadn't had, you know, the, the tools in my box, let's put it that way, to say, no, mm -hmm. this is dangerous for me. And I finally quit smoking a, cigarettes again after 42 years. So the struggle is real with all forms of abuse. But I feel that the way things are done in Europe, the clinics that are paid for by Social Security and are nationwide, or I know a lot about the programs in Finland and what they use with um, injections against alcohol for those that are, um, have great difficulties with it. So if there's any interest in finding out how those programs work and what they do, and it's not based on 12 steps at all, um, then I'd be happy to that information having been through it twice <laughs> well congratulations um let me add that the the whole marijuana thing i it's um you now i have i have 20 years of sobriety but it's been way longer since i had smoked marijuana um from what i've heard it's gotten way stronger and way so so really the the psychological only is is sometimes not necessarily true you know um with that at, at this point is what people have told me um yeah congratulations and yes other countries probably do this way better than we do and um I am getting to the next section is is more about what life ring is and how it works. Um, oh. let, me, let me tell you, Karen, that we didn't do much before you joined us because we had um, technical issues. Oh, so okay. We didn't miss too much, okay? Okay, great. <laughs> All you, right. Karen. I just want to say that one last thought and then I'll be quiet. Um, I not only had psychological um, withdrawal systems. I actually had physical withdrawal symptoms, something mm -hmm. that's often said that ma marijuana doesn't cause withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, it really yeah. does because I needed to have stopped for two weeks before I was allowed to enter the clinic. And I got lost driving to work and back every yeah. single day for two uh. weeks. Um, even though yeah. I've been driving it for 25 years and headaches, nausea, and everything else that went along with it. So it's, you know, people who pop pot and say, you know, oh, I use marijuana mm -hmm. as long as you don't drink. Mm -hmm. I just, my warning is always be careful if you're a person who's easy, uh, act, you know, addictive, yeah. then everything is difficult. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and I would like to add, since you brought up one thing that people always say that isn't necessarily true, um, something you hear in in treatment and and recovery circles a lot is that um, withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines tranquilizers can kill you. Everything else, especially opioids, you'll just wish you were dead. That is not always true. No. Um, withdrawal can take a horrible toll on the body. I, it, I won't get started because I'll, I'll get on a rant about this. <laughs> yeah. Are there I, more questions? 
Yes, uh, one more, uh, Jim Young. Uh, I just want to say that, uh, well, I, I probably one of the most fervent skeptics amongst this group, but I watch a lot of uh, videos, um, people who share testimonials, their firsthand experiences. And what I've learned is testimonials are the worst possible evidence uh, there is because people see things through a shaded lens and to rely on testimonials as evidence of the efficacy of anything or uh, it's, it's just a horrible practice for any free thinker, uh, critical thinker to get involved in. We need to remain skeptical and require evidence. And we should always be very skeptical of these testimonials. Now, I know people who are alcoholics and I've wanted desperately to be able to help them. Unfortunately, I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified to advise uh, anybody on what we're discussing here today. So I, I have no uh, opinion to offer on any of this. I want to listen only to the professionals and really the uh, I guess you could say the qualified and certified professionals. So uh, the general public at large who've had their war stories and experiences, I just, sorry, I'm not buying them. I'm, I'm going to have to discount that. And I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm sure it's very real to the individuals who've lived it, but it's not scientific. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Lisa, are we ready to move on? Or did you want to address Yeah. Anything? Okay. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure the last person who commented, I, I, I would just say that, you know, um, not being a medical professional that that's, you know, uh, uh, but if you knew somebody, um, no, you couldn't tell them this is what they should do, but you could say, here's your option. And, and that's, you know, the reason for me being here is, is right. to make more people aware of what the options are. I, I, I agree with the science part. Unfortunately, the published papers aren't good science when it comes to recovery. Um, I, I, I wish they were, and you know, with the PAL study, now we're finally, I think, kind of looking at what the real issue has been. But um, yeah, I have a, a, a not, not, you know, medical, yes, proof of efficacy is, is very good, um, but numbers can be slanted and studies can be biased. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh-huh. Slide 14. I'm sorry, was there a question or were you? No, we can go on. I, if there's another question, that's fine. I'm sorry. I, no, I don't see anybody panned up. That's okay. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, Life Ring does not have a program. We believe each person needs to develop their own personal recovery plan. That's what's going to work for you. That's what you're going to be willing to work with. Um, but you can share, we can share with each other what's worked for us, what are some thoughts and ideas. Life Ring is based on the three S philosophy, so sobriety, secularity, and self-help or self-determination or self-empowerment. We do a lot with that last one. Uh, next slide. As I, as I said before, um, by sobriety, we mean abstinence from alcohol and other non-medically indicated drugs. 
Um, so the implications of that being we are supportive of people taking medication, um, using some kind of medication assisted recovery. Um, I've known people in recovery who had very severe pain issues. If you're working with your doctor and using things appropriately, it is certainly not my place to tell you you're not sober. Um, life ring groups include people without distinction um, as to their quote unquote drug of choice. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times it, that that old um, hi, my name is Lisa. I'm an, an alcoholic and an addict. And we're all here for the same reason. Um, uh, it, it, we focus more on the present and and then we do the past. So, I, you know, it's it's not just for alcoholics or just for people addicted to opioids or just for, you know, anyone with a substance use disorder. Uh, right, please. Yeah. Uh, secularity. Yes, we are secular. <laughs> we do not use prayer. We do not talk about religion. Um, and individual groups might be a little more tough on that. Or, you know, if you have a member who mentions they went to church, they're not going to be run out of the meeting. If they start trying to tell everybody else they need to go to church, the convener is going to pull them aside and have a talk with them. Um, Life ring is, is not just for atheists and agnostics although a lot of us are, uh, but according to the last internal survey we did, and I can't remember what year, it might have been 2015, might have been 2017, about 40% of Life Ring participants attend a church or other place, place of worship at least once a year. Um, you know, for some people, they just want support without being told what to do. Um, you know, 12-step methodology is pretty prescriptive. We do not allow attacks on religion in our meetings. Um, we sometimes walk the fine line with, with a 12-step a, a refugee. Sometimes people come to life ring meetings who are really kind of traumatized from their experiences in 12-step meetings. And, and of course, we want to let them vent and get that out, but in, in a way that is not going to be potentially insulting to anyone else. Right. Uh, next slide, yeah. please. Self-help. Self-help. Uh, life ring groups provide peer support. Um, majority of meetings um, are a how was your week format where we talk about what's going on um, in, in our current week or you know, if you haven't been to a meeting in two weeks, two weeks, um, anything, any particular challenges coming up, um, you know, how these are affecting our sobriety, how they're just affecting us in general, because, you know, it, um, for people in recovery, you know, um, a lot of times it's not any single big thing. Sometimes it is that that leads to a resumption of using. Um, a lot of times it's a culmination of a lot of little things. And, and so we just, we're there to support and listen. And perhaps, you know, tell somebody what, what worked for us or offer a suggestion, but we're not there to tell people what they have to do. I can't know what somebody else has to do. I'm not them. Um, and Life Ring members can attend um, other types of meetings, including 12-step meetings, or uh, frequently a lot of people start out doing SMART and Life Ring and, and um, then kind of just stick with the Life Ring after a while. SMART is uh, very good for people in early recovery. Uh, next slide. Got it. Uh, the addicted self and the sober self. Um, and, and when I first discovered Life Ring, this, I, I really, I, I liked this um, a lot. Um, here you see the, the sober self, the little S and the big A, meaning the addicted self is kind of prevalent in the, you know. Um, but there's still that sober self in there. Um, the message I got 
uh, when I was involved with 12-step programs was that um, pretty much, you know, if you're in active addiction, you're kind of worthless. There's nothing <laughs> Until you get sober, there's nothing redeeming about you. It, it you know, um, that that sort of almost you need to um, be born again into your sober life. And and um, but even when people are in active addiction, even strongly in active addiction, at times there's that piece of them that knows they want out or that, that maybe is able to function in, in certain ways or, or you know, um, I don't think anyone's ever a lost cause. Um, I don't believe, and Life Ring really doesn't subscribe to this whole um, you got to hit rock bottom thing. Yeah. Um, no. Um, uh, I don't think you have to wait for a certain benchmark until you've gotten arrested or until you've been hospitalized or until whatever. Um, you know, I personally, I believe rock bottom is when you're six feet under, and prior to that, there's always hope. Uh, next slide. Okay. This is basically, um, you know, a life ring meeting, an interaction between sober people um, and those sober parts of them. So life ring meetings, we don't do drunk logs or drug logs. Um, in fact, if somebody starts going down that path, the convener is is going to, you know, redirect them. Um, uh, it's okay to talk about, you know, um, things that have happened to you and um, uh, feelings you have about that, but to just sort of glorify, glamorize the using, we don't do that. Next slide. Got it. So, um, one of Life Ring's little sayings is um, empower your sober self. And um, this is what happens. We're empowering each other's sober selves when, when, you know, we're interacting in this way. Um, not sitting around talking about, you know, who did more of this drug or who did, you know, those are not conducive to recovery. Next. Got it. Uh, so Life Ring has several books. Um, Recovery by Choice is a workbook. It's a self-study. Um, and you don't have to work it from front to back. You, it has various domains. Um, and, but you can go right to whatever is speaking to you at the moment. Uh, we do have a couple of workbook meetings. I forgot to mention those in, in the specialty. Um, and sometimes people who are using the workbook, doing work in it, might attend a meeting and talk about eh, things they discovered or were struggling with. Or um, Powering Your Sober Self was Life Ring's first book, written by Marty Nicholas. Uh, hugely popular book, and just sort of talks about sobriety and, and trying to just sort of get people to be able to think in, in a different way about it, getting away from that 12 stuff is the only way kind of thing. How was your week? Um, goes into a lot more detail about life ring philosophy, about the, the philosophy behind the three S's. It is also uh, the convener's handbook, the convener being the person who um, facilitates life ring meetings. Um, it, it gives a lot of um, tips and and on, on how to do that. Um, uh, Humanly Possible, our most recent book, is a collection of stories about secular recovery. It is not limited to uh, life ring stories. Um, they um, got submissions from people, I believe, in Women for Sobriety, Smart Recovery, um, Life ring, and there's even one submission from somebody who was involved with AA Agnostica.
Okay, we're ready for questions. Yep. Anybody have any questions? Jim Young? Um, one of the questions is, are any of these books available in Spanish in, uh, in Central America? I, I'm living in Costa Rica, so um, if I were able to get up my hands on uh, some of these books in Spanish, I would certainly love to pass them on to uh, individuals that I know need help. That is an excellent question. I wish I could say yes. We actually have a gentleman in Mexico who's been working, starting to do some translations for us. Um, what, what I can say is towards the end, I will, um, I have one more brief section and then I, there will be a slide with my email address. And um, if you wanna shoot me an email, I can kind of, you know, bookmark it that, um, you know, we might be having some some at least pamphlets available soon. That would be good. The rest of the books can be bought on lifering.org or Amazon. Um, and would I be in trouble if I translated the uh, the books? and printed them out, portions of them, and gave them to people, would, would I be violating uh, any? Uh... They are copyrighted. Um, but what I would say, again, contact me. If you're willing to do that work and share it with us, um, we would be overjoyed and, and thrilled. Well, I do <laughs> but I would know have some to get people official here permission. that are bilingual that can assist in something like this. Um, so I, I don't I know whether I want to talk. Um, I, I'll, uh, uh, Judy, if you already probably already have Lisa's email, yes, <laughs> can you can you pass that along to me? Yeah, I appreciate it. No Thank problem. You. Awesome. Any other questions? Are you going to go over about starting a chapter, Lisa? I don't want to ask questions that you're going to cover. Um, I don't know that I have anything specific about that. Okay. So um, I just have a brief section left. But what, what I can say is um, send me an email if okay. you're interested. Um, uh, we do what we can to help people do that. Um, it can be challenging, you know, I, I, Akron, Ohio is the birthplace of AA. Um, when I started the meeting here 10 years ago, um, yeah, it, it was not a friendly environment. It's gotten a little friendlier, but um, it's rather exciting. We've lasted 10 years. Okay, uh, Linda has a question. Yes, hello. Okay, my question is, I know you guys uh, have a no, like a eating disorder program for those who have addictions like chemical addictions. But mm -hmm. do you guys have something for those who are strictly struggling with food issues and who have no other ones, like no alcoholism, no drug use or anything like that? Um, no, we do not. Okay. <laughs> and I know that Overeaters Anonymous um, any kind of support group, it can be a challenge to find a, a secular version. Yeah, I've been through over years of Dominus, and most of the people there are overweight and they've been there like for decades. So I can tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We, we just, you know, not to say none of that other stuff is important. We're also aware that if you try to be all things to all people, you end up being nothing to anybody, right. you know? Yeah. Lisa, I was going to save my question to the end, but um, since Linda asked that question, I wanted to answer that with, um, I was going to ask what's the difference between um, your group and um, Smart Recovery? Have you heard of them? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I mentioned them a few times. And then, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But um, so Smart they have Recovery some is- groups for women and yeah. weight loss. 
Oh, okay. And mm-hmm. that might be an, uh, smart recovery is based on cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. Mm-hmm. Um, it, uh, so it's about, and I'm, I'm not involved with smart. So, um, are you, do you, are you maybe? Well, you know more I, I actually I recently have pursued looking into their groups on weight loss and, um, well, I can't remember if they said if they have one, but they also said they have a women's only group. And that tends to be very mixed on in terms of, I guess, you know, the addictive behavior. So um, I would say check it out. I'm, I'm going to look into it too, Linda. I, I can tell you that it, while life ring secular recovery deals strictly with um, substance use disorder, Smart recovery deals with substance use disorder and what's called process addictions. So um, food addiction, gambling, those would be process addictions. Mm -hmm. Um, So they might have some specialized online meetings for that. LifeRing does not do um, strictly process addictions. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Jim Peterson? You're muted, Jim. Yes, I, I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> I'm coming. All right. Um, yeah, it seems to me that uh, that um, eating addictions, so-called, uh, are rather uh, more difficult not to deal with because unlike drugs and alcohol, uh, you can forfend the use of eat. those things entirely. You can't go without eating. And right. Of course, mm-hmm. uh, eating also involves necessary physiological um, uh, uh, events that occur in the body that uh, that also have a particular role. So eating uh, so-called disorders and uh, eating maybe addictions uh, need to be dealt with, uh, I think, on a higher professional level. Um, although undoubtedly some, a program like, like this and others would be helpful in in helping people restrain themselves regarding certain kinds of food and uh, and and that sort of thing but overall it's it's a pretty tough nut to crack yeah i would i'd agree with you jim uh as a overeater i totally agree with what you're saying i think it does uh, because it's like uh having a food disorder it's like it would be for the alcoholic. You can, you have to have your three drinks a day, but you can't go over that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Which, like, yeah, but you I have that problem to drink. by not doing yeah. it at all. Yeah, but it's like the it's like a form of alcoholism where you have to have those three drinks a day. You cannot just do abstinence. And yeah. I think that's what makes eating disorders so much harder because you have to eat the stuff that you're kind of hooked on. <laughs> you know, you got to do it to survive. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Well, so, thanks, guys, um, any other questions? I'm sorry, Lisa, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> I was talking to my husband. I apologize. Oh, okay. All right, are we ready to move, move on? on? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I think these will be pretty brief. Um, slide okay. 23. So LifeRing, as I said, does not have a program. We encourage individuals to develop their own personal recovery program. Um, we have the workbook, which they may choose to use. They may not. Um, uh, you know, recovery plan can include all kinds of things. And, and um, even those that are very involved in, with 12-step um, programs. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I had turned the volume off and uh, anyway, um, so uh, even those that are, um, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, it's okay, take your time. Oh, 12 step, even those that are very involved with 12 step, um, 
in working the steps and, and working with their sponsor and they do other stuff too. Um, this concept that, you know, a recovery plan um, can include all kinds of things, including maybe going to the gym as part of your recovery plan. It is for a lot of people some kind of working out early in recovery, especially get, later on. We get a little lazy about it maybe, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, it can include therapy. It, it can it, all all kinds of things, and that's really not any different you see that a lot in people who are involved with 12 step stuff. It's just they don't call that part of their recovery. I mean, it's they don't consider it part of their recovery plan, or yeah. it's just something separate. Um, so it's it's not really so outside the box of what has worked for some people in a way. Um, uh, yes, we we do have the workbook. A lot of people haven't used it, but that's fine. We don't, none of our books, you won't see people carrying our books typically into a meeting unless it's a workbook meeting. Um, they're not required for participation. If you've never read any of the Life Ring books, you're not going to be lost during a meeting or anything like that. Next slide. How is Life Ring similar to AA or NA? We are abstinence based. Although with that caveat that we're not trying to play doctor with you, and if there's, you know, part of your recovery plan is using medication-assisted recovery, that's certainly your choice. And if it works, we're thrilled. Um, group support. I mean, bottom line, a lot of this is about group support. And meetings are confidential in Life Ring, even though we don't have the word anonymous in our name. Okay. Um, next slide, how is Life Ring different? Well, it, we believe the power to get, you know, uh, find recovery is within us, not within some outside force. Um, although that it doesn't mean that people can't use Life Ring support if they are a believer, because I know people that do. Um, we welcome people regardless of their drug of choice. Um, we encourage crosstalk. I, I don't know how many of you have ever, oh, um, I don't know if it, this will make sense, but um, so in 12 step meetings, crosstalk, that's a no no, a huge no no. Um, a discussion meeting in, in a 12 step environment will be. Each person takes their turn. There's not really any back and forth or interaction. Um, Life Ring believes that that back and forth and interaction is where you really get the good stuff. Now, with 12-step, it usually happens before or after the meeting because it's not supposed to happen during the meeting. Yeah. Um, but a Life Ring meeting, it happens during the meeting. Um, so, uh, you know, I may relate to something somebody said and say, oh, you know, I went through the same thing when when I had that much sobriety or or you know when that happened to me I tried this you might want to think about that or you know but not you, you need to do this this way um, uh, and of course the personal recovery plan uh, no one size fits all next slide um, I think I've already talked about all this. I, one of the biggies for a lot of people, it seems like something small, but it's kind of big in a way. Um, you know, 12 step meetings are known for ending with some kind of prayer. Life ring meetings do not. Um, we usually end up with a mutual round of applause for each other um, for our successes and, and being there and, and, um, it's it's just a, a nice way to end. Um, next slide. I've mentioned workbook meetings. We also sometimes have um, a topic meetings where, where it's not a how was your week meeting. It may be a topic, although a lot of how was your week meetings sort of turn into a topic meeting based upon whatever was going on with somebody during the week that a lot of people related to. Um, we do have some, uh, some of our online meetings are open camera required. 
Um, typically, this is our co-occurring disorders. Um, people feel it's important to be able to look at each other in order to open up. They, if somebody's off camera, they feel kind of like somebody's lurking and, you know. It, it, um, and we have a few hybrid meetings, online and in person, which. Okay. Next slide. Oh, uh, Life Ring Tampa Bay. Um, there, there, are, there is a Life Ring presence in Florida. It's in the Tampa Bay, Bay area. Um, uh, Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg. Um, so the, there is a website. Um, I have a resource page for you, which I will get to in a couple slides. Okay. Um, Tampa Bay, um, the gentleman who who's in charge of this area, who who kind of runs things, keeps things going, um, has been involved with Life Ring since the beginning. Um, he has a phenomenal resource page of books, podcasts, recovery blogs, what anything you might. Yeah, he, I would urge you, even you know, if you don't know anybody with a problem, you might want to check out that page. Um, there are local online meetings for those in the Tampa Bay, St. Petersburg area, which you could access by going to that website. Um, they were formerly in person. We do have some Life Ring meetings that, that are doing this, like the local online thing, where they want to stick mostly local. It, it's trying to help people feel connected um, despite the conditions we've been dealing with with the pandemic. Um, I'm going to skip that question one and just go to slide 30, lifering.org, and here is my email address. It's pretty easy. And of course, Judy has it. Um, yeah. And then the next slide, um, that link, and, and Judy, I don't know if you can copy that and. Um, Whoops. Uh, put it in chat or um, uh, when I when I get out of um, full screen, I can probably copy it and put it in chat. Um, yeah. Um, so what I did was like references to some life ring um, information or online meetings, uh, Tampa Bay life ring. Um, the, some of the studies, the PAL study papers that I've mentioned. Um, I just did a Google Doc that I web published, so don't look to be impressed with formatting or anything like that. Um, <laughs> it's pretty simplistic, but it seemed like a really easy way to share mm -hmm. um, the stuff with you guys. So those are all active links in that document. Cool. And the remaining documents were like, should have been removed. They were kind of junk slides, so just ignore them. Okay. So is that all that you wanted to share in the screen? That is it, yes. Okay. All right. Um, any any questions that have come up uh, with this stuff that she just presented? Oops. Let me see if I can get that. Um, link to put in chat. Okay, I've got the link. I'm putting it in chat now. There you go. Um, well, Lisa, thank you so much. I I I thought this was very interesting. I I'm um, I did not realize there was a life ring in Tampa. <laughs> I live in Tampa. So. Oh. Yeah, actually, they've been around for quite a while. Really? Um, but, yeah. But, again, here, the, it just goes to show you that, you know, I mean, it, AA gets all the attention. Yeah. AA, NA, you know. Yeah. Well, one of our concerns, of course, is that people who go to court, they get sentenced to AA. Mm -hmm. and Often mm -hmm. there aren't other resources available, um, mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that uh, while 
Um, I've never been addicted to any drug. Um, I'm obviously addicted to food or some <laughs> I've up, but I've never been addicted to a drug. So I would not be an appropriate person to start a group like this, but I'm hoping we can find uh, someone in other parts of the state, uh, since we already have one in Tampa, that uh, might be interested in doing this program or some uh, form thereof. That's um, important work. You're yes. Doing. Thank you. Anybody that's interested, I'm also the Frontier Regions Coordinator. Frontier Regions being those places where life rings not at all or not very established. Um, it can be challenging and we do what we can from our end to, to help with that. Um, uh, you know, the person on the ground is one of the, you know, big job. But um, yeah, there are people, we have a lot of online meetings available, but there are people for whom in-person is really what they want. Right. And treatment facilities really want to send their newly sober people to in-person meetings versus mm -hmm. online. Um, life ring meetings, um, the online ones, in-person, I, I know of no meetings that won't sign up a court paper for somebody. Um, Occasionally, that could be a battle, but Life Ring would provide a, a, what support we could, what minimal support we could, mm -hmm. if, if it got to be a battle. For the most part, courts just accept them, but we have had some cases where they were like, no, it's not an AA meeting, you're not allowed, and, right. and I knew a woman who was going to um, SOS meetings, and SOS, yeah. a little bit in New York, not much anywhere else anymore, but... Um, who sick the um, Freedom from Religion Foundation on her parole officer because they weren't going to let her count the SOS meetings. <laughs> um, and it worked, so, you know. Good. Uh, Jim Peterson, you have a question? Um, yes, I see it's getting rather thick with cats in here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, one one last, last question, and uh, that is, do you have a, uh, like, um, a board of directors or a board of people, professionals who can race their certificates and so forth in order to give some authentication to, to the overall philosophy and effort to make it more acceptable to the courts. Um, okay, several things to unpack. Yes, we do have a board of directors. No, it does not consist um, solely of professionals. We have um, uh, various professionals. One for certain that off the top of my head is in the treatment industry. Um, I, I think, you know, that's why things like the PAL study are so important because um, there's that evidence, there's that proof published, you know, in a peer-reviewed, you know, peer-reviewed published in a journal, very scientifically sound as far as its methodology. And to have those kinds of things to, to be able to say, hey, look here. Um, you know, professionals really, I know smart recovery was developed by a psychologist. And so there's probably more professionals involved with that. Um, with the exception of smart though, um, substance use disorder support organizations tend not to be um, you know, staffed or manned necessarily by people um, who are in the industry themselves. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lisa. Um, any other questions before we go? I've got one for you. Okay. A very hard one. What is your YouTube channel called? Uh, it's called Atheist of Florida. Thank you. You're welcome. Karen, you have a question? Unmute. I, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I understand Jim's point, but I also must say, as being an addict myself, or a former one, and having been with many, many addicts <laughs> together, it's a question of trust. I mean, we're not talking about, we're talking about mostly 
post recovery. In other words, about talking to others who have traveled a similar journey, though not the same. And it's a question of trust and the professionals are good and we need their support, but we also need that person that we can call um, mm -hmm. or that we can, who's been that or knows that feeling. And from my own experience and from others' experience, when we talk about what do we do when we get that itchy feeling, um, it's generally 10 or 15 minutes you have to get through. And if you can reach somebody in your support system during that time, you can actually maybe not relapse. It doesn't always mm -hmm. work, but it often does. And one of the things we learned during that time was always to have somebody, a buddy or somebody we felt we could trust. And those are the type of things that happen in these kind of support groups among each other. Mm -hmm. So we need the professionals, but we also need the others um, all working together. And um, sadly, here in the US, um, from what I've seen from the systems in Europe, we have additionally the doctors. Every recovery and every rehab facility also goes through your entire medical and deals with your medical issues parallel and your psychological issues. So the more we can get a mixture of different types of people approaching this, I feel the more successful it is for everyone. Those are just my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I concur. Yeah, I, I uh, do support for people with cancer. And um, one of the things they try to do is match up people who've had the same kind of cancers and be able so you know what, what, what you've been through and how it relates to what they're going to go through or what they're going through right then. And it, it was a very big help to me when I was under treatment to be able to talk to someone who had been through it. And I think this is a very mm -hmm. similar kind of thing. It's another medical condition. Mm -hmm. I, I view um, substance abuse or substance use disorder as a medical condition. I don't, I don't think it's just whatever. Moral failing. Right. Well, Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Condition needs to be treated as such. So. Okay. Um, anything else before we go? Thank you so much, Lisa. It's been such a struggle. <laughs> I can't. Thank you for for you know helping me work this out so we can still continue to do yes. it today. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. So, um, thank you, Lisa. Next week, you're welcome. We will be talking. Is it next week? Let me see. I got here. Um, we will talky, be talking with Clint Hickok. I never can say his name right. Sorry about cults. And uh, he was with us before and talked about um, uh, Christian nationalism. And now he's going to talk to us about cults. So I look forward to seeing all of you next week and uh, we will be moving forward. And Lisa, I'll be in touch with you about if we find somebody who wants to start a group to get that going. But thank you everyone for coming. Phenomenal. And, uh, Phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. If you are pleased with our programs, please tap the like button and then subscribe to our channel. Don't forget the bell so you don't miss any notices of new material. We usually post new content every week. See our created playlists to discover events thus far this year or to see a list of topics and speakers from our rapidly growing and diverse collection since 1992.